This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am here with Jennifer Conweiler, the world's leading authority on introverted leadership. How are you, my friend? I am feeling terrific. Thank you, David. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to be talking to you. So this is such a hot topic because everybody, I think, has this upside down, backwards, crazy, and wrong. They think (laughs) that leadership is all about being the alpha dog, being big, being Mm -hmm. bold, being in the public eye, having a high energy personality. You know, we all need to be Richard Branson, we all need to be, you know, pick your favorite CEO. We all need to be that hard driving, big, bold, loud personality. True or false? Absolutely false. So tell us, how did you come to study introverted leadership? I'd love to get the backstory and then we'll just dive right into all these myths and misconceptions. Sure. And I, I like to say that up front because people are surprised. They just assume that I'm an introvert. I'm actually extroverted. Like with you, David, we were chatting. People don't know you're really introverted. So it's what you see isn't always what you get. And really, it's about energy. Just to start out on that plane, we know that Carl Jung was the person that sort of coined the term way back in the time of Freud and all those great psychologists. And he said it was about energy and where we got our energy. And introverts get their energy from within, extroverts from outside in the world. So they are energized by people. Not that introverts can't be effective with people. They can be unbelievably effective. But it's all about where you get burnt out. (laughs) You know, how much can you take of people, right? People exhaust you. So how did I get into this? Really, you know, David, a lot of our work as professionals, if we will, and I'm putting quote marks on now, has to do with a burning desire to understand what's going on in our families and with our friends and in our personal life. I've always found that to be the motivator and for my curiosity about things that leads to other learnings. And so over 45 years ago, I met uh, this guy that I eventually married. But when I first met Bill, my husband, and actually married him, I was increasingly concerned about the fact that he didn't speak very much. You know, what's wrong, Bill? I asked that. You know, he was very quiet. And what we often find with opposites, I found this in my research with extroverts and introverts, is that what first attracts us, David, you know, like Paula Abdul, opposites attract, then can actually drive us crazy after a while, right? So I'm like, my friends are right. I never should have married this guy. What's going on? And so at the same time, there was a confluence of forces because I was exposed to the Myers-Briggs. And so like a lot of people, that becomes sort of a touchstone when you realize that there is nothing wrong with personality types, you know, even though you might have grown up thinking and judging. So I started to understand more about Bill and he did as well. And we're still together all these years. I don't think necessarily that made a huge difference, but it provided a language for us to communicate. So after that, shortly after I was working in education and then got into industry into working in technology. And so you can imagine a lot of engineers, IT folks, and I always found myself very frustrated along with them that I could see them overlooked and ignored, misunderstood, not heard in meetings, being passed up for promotions. And this became a real concern to me over time. I didn't really articulate it as to the area that I was going to actually study more deeply until I made a commitment to pick a lane, as you guys talk about in marketing, and uh, work with Sam Horn. Some of you know that Sam and I started meeting in the late 2007, 2008, as I was so trying to circle this, in. Yeah. You know, before yeah. This, you were a communications consultant or communication no. expert? Actually, I'm a helper from way back. My degrees are in counseling and organizational development. So I went on and got, did graduate work and worked in higher education and worked in government. And then I had my own business. I had actually three different iterations of a consulting firm that I had. So related to career consulting, those kinds of things. So it was initially career consulting, but before we got into the whole introverted leadership niche. Yes. And in fact, it's interesting you bring that up because many of my clients who were very frustrated, my individual and group coaching clients, this just kept coming up all the time. And when they would then learn about their introversion and started to get a little more confidence and acceptance that nothing was wrong with them, that I thought this message needs to get out to more people. It can't just be sitting here in my office one-on-one. And so that's when I started looking at how could I, I knew that writing a book would be a way to get it out and also be a tool for 
the clients that I had who had no resources at that time. Now, let's talk about this in terms of leadership, because I think it's also a common misconception that to be a leader, you have to be extroverted and to be a good speaker or consultant, you also have to be extroverted. You know, people will often say to me, whether it's a client or an audience member, oh, David, I could never do what you do because you're so big, you're so loud, you're so bold. And of course, they have no idea that I'm really programmed as an introvert, but my personality might be big and bold and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think the most compelling leaders and the most compelling speakers are the ones that draw people in and not the ones that fire hose and blast and broadcast their vision. So what are some of the misconceptions or myths around the big, loud, brash people like me versus the really effective communicators and the really effective leaders? Well, you identified one of them. You know, people think it's about being out there. And I know many introverts who have mastered the art of social interactions, like could work a room. They don't really like it, but they do. And in terms of speaking, that's probably the biggest misconception. And what I found with the introverted leaders that I interviewed is that they're incredible speakers. And many, by the way, most performers, David, comedians, actors, are introverted. And why is that? And so when I delved into it with folks, when I interviewed them, it was about being prepared, leveraging their strengths, David, which is preparation, which is listening. And they did that in terms of also influencing across an organization. I identified six key strengths that they use, like engaged listening, like having one-on-one conversations, not just getting up there in the cafeteria and you know making pronouncements. It was really understanding what the issues were with employees and then coming back with proposals based on what they were hearing. And it was writing. Writing is another, like you do, David, when I get your emails, I think about that. (laughs) It's content and it's well thought out and extroverts don't always do that. So that's the main thing that you notice about introverted leaders. If they are thoughtful, reflective, and I'll say one more piece of feedback, and that is calmness. You know, in the kind of craziness that we have in our organizations today, I've been working quite a bit in Silicon Valley and the high tech leaders who are more reserved, who can present a message in a way where people really can hear it. I just did a one-on-one with a senior leader up there and we had a Q&A and, and people felt so comfortable, David, opening up in a situation. That's just an example of a woman who they didn't know was very introverted. And that's actually the very exciting thing that's happening now is people are coming out of the closet. Yes, for sure. Well, you've been studying this for a good number of years and I want to ask mm-hmm. you about, because you've got a new edition of your book, The Introverted Leader. Right. And I love the subtitle, Building on Your Quiet Strength. Mm -hmm. What do you think, and I know that you also have the book about opposites. Genius opposites, right. Exactly. Right. What do you think the introverted folks listening can learn from the extroverts? And similarly, what can our extroverted Mm -hmm. listeners learn from that quiet strength of the introverts? Yes. Well, it's not either or in terms of whether we're introverted or extroverted. One of the things that I've come in the last 12 years of working in this, it truly is a spectrum. You know, I wasn't that planted in that belief earlier, but so we all have it within us. We all have the potential you know, for me, I'm becoming more introverted. Now, Bill still doesn't believe that, my husband, but I keep telling him because we move over to the other side. So I think that's one thing to realize that you want to tap into that other side, just as the introverts are learning kind of to get out there and kind of rehearse what they're going to say or their goal when they're in a networking meeting or in speaking. So they feel more comfortable. We all can pull into that reserve. So I just want to say that to start. It's not either or on that. So what could introverts learn from extroverts? What they admire about extroverts is their ability to, as my mother-in-law used to say, uh, get a tree to talk. You know what I'm saying? Just the comfort of, as I said, working the room or, or bringing people out. Now, the extroverts will say, when you talk about, I'm just going to flip it because you said about the introverts, what they, they get frustrated. What do you think they get frustrated about when they're having an interaction with an introvert? Maybe the person's not talking enough. It's like pulling teeth. It's exhausting. They'll say, I'm just going to give up. And I'm also not learning from them. So what I work with introverts on is how can you kind of prepare so you can think about what you've been up to lately, if you could share some learnings from your recent conference, just to get yourself, if you're prepared, you're fine as an introvert, right, David? I mean, you're totally fine. So it's like using that. So what else could extroverts, uh, so introverts learn? Another thing that introverts learn from extroverts, they tell me, is how to be more aware 
uh, the ambiance, let's say in a meeting. So if they notice that people are not talking, a lot of extroverts will sort of reach out. Now, some won't. They'll keep talking. Ones who have that radar where they're, you know, extroverts kind of see the room, that sort of helps. I think that answered your question. We probably could go more on that. But what the genius opposites I found was when introverts and extroverts work together, it's not just one plus one, it's exponential. I heard one story of, uh, you talk about how they build off each other. There was a sales team and Marty was the guy who's the more extroverted one. He's up there making the presentation and his friend Brian or his colleague was in the room of sales reps having sort of very quiet, just touch bases with their prospects and finding out what the reaction was, chatting with them. So together, they had the most successful year ever as a sales team because, again, they use the strengths that each other have. Now, there are other things that drive each other crazy, but we we could spend more time on that. Right. Hey, this interview is a real moneymaker. If you're serious about ramping up your reach and revenue as a speaker, trainer, or expert, book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team. The link is doitmarketing.com slash call. It will be the most valuable 45 minutes you invest in your speaking-driven business. Speaking of value, let's get back to the show. Now, going back to Myers-Briggs for one second, Mm -hmm. you mentioned that you and your husband had taken this. Are you polar opposites on all four dimensions or no? No. For folks who aren't familiar with Myers-Briggs, and it's not the only instrument, you know, people use DISC and they use others to drill down. And there's some controversy. There's the big five, you know, but I still always go back to Myers-Briggs. Bill and I are opposite on everything. He's an INTJ, which if you know anything about Myers-Briggs, it's a very rare type. Bill and I are the same on the intuitive. So we have a lot of fun brainstorming. He's very conceptual. He just retired as a college professor. So I love to brainstorm with him though. Or I like to just think big picture. Yeah. Yeah. But three out of four, you're different. Yeah, we are. Yeah. How about you and your wife? Complete opposite. So again, we're just getting geeky here on the Myers-Briggs test. Yeah. INTJ, that's who you're talking to now. You and Bill would get along great. (laughs) And she's what? She's ENFP. So- Opposite on all four, like complete polar opposite. But it's challenging sometimes, right? But you understand it. And it's, <laughs> like you said, it's a great working vocabulary. So it now, really it's like, is. You, know, you know, we'll even make jokes about, honey, you're having an ENFP moment right now. What will they think? I don't care what they will think. I'm just going to do it, right? That's what the I, right? So, no, but there's a community out here. There's other people. I don't exactly. Care. But you're brainstorming and you're giving her another perspective. And I think one of the exciting things I mentioned to you, I'm working, the new book that I have coming out is, as I look at the next evolution of this work, and I've been helping and coaching through my books, and I've been very fortunate that they've been received well. And it's been a lot about how interpersonally, how do we make it work? First, intrapersonally, if we look at ourselves and kind of stepping into our power, whether we're introvert or extrovert. And then the second thing is, like you said, genius opposites. How do we make this work and really build on the beautiful connections and collaborations of different types of people? But now where we're at, and I think it's a really exciting, important time in history, and particularly in terms of my expertise, which is looking at organizations. In the workplace, how do we make it a place that's introvert friendly? Because it has been so type A. So we're asking people to uh, adjust and to learn how to prepare and be out there. But are we really looking at how our, for instance, open spaces are serving or not serving, you know, introverts, how our meetings are structured, how we lead and what we expect in our performance reviews from people. And what I found in the research, I did a survey that I'm going to share in in my book, which is I got over 220 responses and the comments were just incredibly passionate because introverts also express themselves a lot through writing, but really passionate in a way that there was still a lot, tremendous amount of concern about how our organizations are not supporting introverts. On the other hand, I am looking at this new work as a chance to be a stimulus, if you will, for our workplaces to start having more of these conversations about how can we adapt and adjust. Because on the positive note, what I did find is that there were a number of pockets of inclusion. So people were taking a look, for instance, on their HR teams. How are we hiring? You know, are we just slipping into hiring people that are just like us? Are we just looking for enthusiasm? If somebody's not a very good communicator, are we dinging them? It just may be they need time to think. Are we stacking our day with 
interview after interview after interview. So they're completely exhausted by the time they have to do their demo or make their presentation at four o'clock, you know. So even making these small changes, I'm starting to see such appreciation from the introverts. And it's really a productivity issue because we are with the talent shortage right now, you know, introverts are not going to say companies that don't support them. So it's really being considered as part of diversity and inclusion work. And I'm very excited about the change we're seeing. And this has been about 12 years in the awareness and now shifting our workplaces. That is so fantastic. And you make a great point. I mean, I think for the companies that, you know, are going to hire you, it's totally about recruiting and retention and performance and effectiveness and profitability, because this is like a, a machine and the machine can be clanking and banging and smoking, or it can be well-oiled, smooth, mm-hmm. operating at peak efficiency. But the introverts, the extroverts, you know, this is like any other sort of problem. If you've got silos, if you've got turf wars, if you've got politics and other kinds of BS, right. nothing compared to the introverts versus extroverts, because this affects 100% Absolutely. of your executive team and 100% of your workforce, right? Absolutely. And so the changes I'm seeing are kind of bubbling up from you know, all levels of the organization, as well as, I'll give you one example of a senior leader. I had such a pleasure. She asked me to come in and work with her uh, R&D team. They were at a retreat. And Caroline McGregor, I profile her in the book. She is Scottish. She's a woman. She's an executive at Merck now. And Caroline said of all of the, she had been reading about introverts and she read my book, she read Susan Cain's. She started to have some real ahas about this. And she said more than anything, not, you know, the fact that she's Scottish, a woman, all of these other identities, she said introversion was the number one identity that she connected with. And so she made it her mission to start to talk about this with women's groups, you know, across the company. And she actually put together a slide deck. And I know you and I were chatting about executive speaking. The influence she's having, I heard from some of the young women who are emerging through the company, for instance, they were at this retreat. They said it meant so much to hear from a woman at her level, actually come out and talk about how she managed her introversion, not repressed it, but used it in a positive way. So these are the kind of pockets of inclusion I'm talking about that we just need a lot more of that. And it's just a privilege to witness this. Yeah, that's really great. Well, and you're doing more than witnessing it. You're helping to catalyze it and to make it happen. Well, thank you. Let's talk a little bit kind of behind the curtains. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about Jennifer Conweiler, (laughs) entrepreneur, the way that you run the business. I know that you've always done a lot of speaking and seminars and workshops, but Mm -hmm. now you have a couple of online courses and kind of tell us how the business evolved or how the business model evolved in the distribution methods that you're putting into your business. Yes. And I've been through different phases of looking at my business like all of us do. And as the tides turn and you realize what you really want to do and where your strengths are, I would say my focus is really on speaking and training. And I'll share with you just another evolution of that that I see happening that I'm very excited about. But And it's always been for me, I love the live interaction. As much as I can get in there and do a keynote and then a few hours of a workshop or a deeper dive, that's when I'm happiest. And that's what I feel like I'm contributing more. And the books have been the model to really springboard that. And it's not so much that I'm pushing the books, but I'm hearing from my readers and my audiences. And I listen really well. I recently kind of identify with the fact that I'm pretty much like a journalist in a way, because I'm sort of picking up what the trends are. I always like to look around corners just as a side note, when I was young, I don't know if, David, you're probably too young to remember this, but there was a comic strip star named Brenda Starr, and she had these dashing adventures and had beautiful red hair and would run around. And I always imagined myself as that. And then I realized, Lisa, you know, kind of you're sort of living that in a way because I'm out there and I'm hearing and listening. So I use the speaking and training as kind of the drivers. The online courses for me have not been, when I realized I didn't want to do business to consumer, I guess I call it B2C. I was involved with several partners who, where we tried to launch that. It didn't work to make any money. In fact, we lost money. So I realized that for me, the online is probably the best model. And I'm doing it now with a project management company. It's just to partner with firms who already do that. Like I'm working with a company called Velocity Teach. 
And I still own my intellectual property, but they share it. They put the course together. Tell us how that works a little bit. I mean, if you're looking at partnering, they fund the course development. Right. And then, and then they, give, they proactively sell it to their people and you exactly. get a royalty. I get a piece of that percentage of it for each one I sell. So there's some incentive for me because I give a discount code at my programs. So whoever buys through them, I get a deal on that. I mean, you don't make huge bucks from it, but for me, it's also one of the things that I feel, David, is getting the books and the ideas out to as many people as possible. I learned this from Lisa McLeod. Lisa is a really terrific speaker who's been in sales for, I don't know if you know Lisa, but I once asked her how she gets her word out. And she said, I give a book to anybody who asks. If I have a prospect who's, you know, sort of just tootling around on my website, I said, would you like a book? And I took that and ran with it. So anytime somebody shows an interest, I send them a book and that gets it out, gets it out and people then know you. So speaking, training. Whoa, what a great interview. Are you taking notes? Remember to visit thespeakingshow.com for complete show notes, links, downloads, and resources related to this episode. See you over there. Did you have any other questions on the online? Well, yeah. So let's talk about marketing because, of course, yeah. that's, that's one of our main interests here. Yeah, that's just a sweet side. spot for you. Yes. Tell us about how your marketing and your uh-huh. approach to marketing has changed. What did you used to do that no longer works and what yeah. you started doing that is now working really well for you? Okay. So when I first started with my first book, I hired a PR firm. We created the packet. Remember the old packet? Oh, yeah. I did some byliners, which were really actually an article that you could then flex to different publications. So it was primarily print media. And um, in terms of my approach, I'm one of these speakers that actually likes marketing. I've always found it to be intriguing. So I've always believed in partnering with anybody I bring on. And I would recommend that to any speakers, consultants. If you are expecting the firm to do it for you, you're going to be very disappointed. Any kind of firm that you hire. So I started with strict PR. Then as I moved through each book, I tried partnering with different firms, but I also always created a strategy. And that strategy started to include social media at the second book, Quiet Influence, when uh, I realized that that was a way to really start to build community around the book. So if we fast forward to today, I work with a firm very selectively. And what I mean by that is I have them help me figure out what's the latest and greatest, what's happening out there. Because I can't possibly keep up With the fact that, for instance, Amazon, a way to sell your books now is to do ads. Like, I'm not going to get into the weeds on that. But yet I might hire a firm that's going to help me put a plan together and then may execute on parts of that plan. So, for instance, I had one firm. They said, well, you need to do these, what do you call them? They were real big a few years ago, the memes. So I had them create that, you know, give me the plan. Let's do a, a timeline for it. And so this kind of approach has worked for me. And I have an assistant, Arlene, who is very hungry to learn too. So I will ask her to partner with the firm to learn it and then we'll turn it over. So I think that's a way that I would share with people that you can be creative with the firms you work with and you will freak out when you hear their prices oftentimes, right? So figure out a way to make it work for you. But I do think you need to rely on experts like you, David, to figure out this changing picture. Don't you think it's changing all the time, every week? It is changing all the time, for sure. Now, you mentioned about PR, visibility, social media. How Mm -hmm. about direct selling, prospecting, filling the pipeline, talking to certain corporations, associations, and groups that you've targeted that you would like to work with? That's probably my weakest spot. However, I have found that if I can focus on the ones that I've worked with in the past and rekindle those fires, I'm shake the bushes, How are you? Let's get back. Let's kind of catch up. I've never been somebody as far as my plan to do that. You know, the cold calls and the reaching out. But however, I'm open to it because I think there is a way to do it in a way that in today's environment where there's some good tools to help us. Like I just recently got a CRM last year and it's made a big difference, customer relationship management. And it's made a really big difference in my follow-up with prospects for instance. So in answer to your question, it's incremental for me. That's not been a driver in terms of how I do sales. I think my sweet spot's always been the PR and the marketing. And PR has also been interesting because PR, of course, has changed. It's all online. But I find that if you can come up with a sort of a counterintuitive idea that builds on your material and your content and get to know reporters, and in my case, quite interesting, most of reporters are introverted. 
So it had a very personal resonance with them, this topic, and it still does. And then they'll come back to you. If you give them good content, they come back. Do you do your own PR? Do you subscribe to a service like PR Leads? Kind of what's your source to get into the PR front door? I have to say, I'm not trying to brag or anything. Like I say, don't brag on yourself in the South, right? Well, I usually get asked by reporters. If you look at my website, I have tons and tons of media. I did spend some money this year. You're making me think of what I did on uh, keywords and on SEO. And so when people do searches, you want them to be able to find you, right? So when they search introverted leadership, hopefully I'm up on the first page. So that's what they do now, the reporters do. Got it. And that's all organic search engine optimization. You're not buying ads or anything. No, no, I haven't bought ads yet. Okay. So tell us about the new book. What's up with the new book? What was the impetus for the new book? What is the new twist? I, I love the fact that you're always staying on the topic of introverted leadership and that you're just going 10 miles deep, one inch wide. That's the space that you own. But tell us about the new book and how that expands and adds some texture to what your existing work is about. Well, thank you for saying that, David, because coming from you, I I have such respect for you. And also, I just have to say, I love that you shake things up. I was telling somebody today, I said, I love that David Newman never just has the typical answer. You know, you make us think. And that's what my goal is to be like you, David, <laughs> be there like you, you. In, you in some respects, <laughs> but I'm married to an INTJ. So, <laughs> so yeah, as far as the new book, I think I talked about this a little bit, but what we're looking at here is as a stimulus and a roadmap, if you will, for companies to start engaging employees in looking more deeply at how they can take a look at how work is done, whether it be remote, whether it be the way the office is set up. Uh, the way that they are working on teams together using digital tools to really benefit all styles. So let's look at brainstorming. Let's look at brain writing. Let's make it part of the discussion instead of an add-on. What I'm really using the book for as a stimulus for discussion, for change. And I'll loop this into the other part I mentioned earlier about training and speaking. And one trend that I see, because I know you're a trend watcher in terms of delivery, and this connects to my new book, having Q&As, having panels with people like the kind of woman I mentioned earlier, Dr. McGregor, having the group engaged in the company talking about these issues, but making it of enough structure that that can happen. And to me, this is the exciting part of where it's kind of the next evolution from TED Talks because it's very interactive. So I encourage speakers to look at how they can do that. And the other idea I'll throw in at this point that I see emerging with speaking, book clubs. Really? This, how does that yes, work? I just came back from my publisher author retreat, and this was talked about quite a bit. It can be virtual, but the benefit to you as a speaker or author is the company buys books. And then you provide a discussion guide. Book clubs are coming back in favor now. So it's not a hard sell. You can just start out with a book club and people are starting to do it by reading a chapter each month. (laughs) You know, people don't have time to read, right, anymore either. And then you can encourage or you could even train, encourage internal facilitators with the discussion guide that you provide to run these book clubs. To me, that's a very exciting development. And then, of course, you as a consultant could come in and offer other programs. But I think listeners should think about anybody with a book, do a book club, encourage a book club. All the company has to do is buy books. Right. Right. Now your publisher on the new book is also Barrett Kohler. Once Barrett again. Kohler. We're partners. Well, tell us how that has worked. I know you've had a long standing relationship with them. Most yes. speakers and experts I talk to, they say, I hate my publisher. I know. All I've heard is amazing things about Barrett Kohler. Yes, David. Tell us about all their wonderfulness and how they're helping you promote all the books, the old books, new books, everything. Yeah, the backlist too, they promote. Well, I, I talked earlier about collaboration and partnership and the mission of Barrett Kohler is connecting people and ideas to create a world that works for all. And Barrett Kohler is ahead of its time. They're really more about recognizing people and really treating their authors as not just a commodity in the process. So I was very fortunate. It was, you know, we always say that luck is preparation and opportunity. It's timing. Because I sent my proposal to a few publishers for my first book. And Steve Persanti, who just stepped down as CEO, is a real introverted leader. And so he was taken by the topic. And it was before we had, you know, hundreds of books on introversion. I mean, I was the first one in the business space. So he helped me shape it. And it was hard. I mean, I didn't really know how to write a book 
in the kind of way that my friend David Greenberg said, it's a real book, <laughs> the speech coach, David Greenberg. So Bear Kohler, they are involved at every step of the way. They care about their authors and they care about their people. And I just mentioned the author retreat I came back from. Yes. It's a very unusual, unique uh, initiative. The authors got together over 25 years ago, soon after the company started, said, we need a way to connect. And I have to tell you, I've been to about nine of them, yeah, nine retreats now, and they've all been quite incredibly rewarding. We challenge each other. We share, we laugh. You know, there's nothing like authors getting together because it can be a very isolating experience as a speaker, as an author. We also offer a very hands-on marketing workshop that we create and bring in speakers like you to engage in. The next I am one's totally going to be available for the next one, by the way. I'm signing you up right now. Princeton, New Jersey is near you. It's going to be super Princeton. close. I can drive. April 21st is 22nd. Awesome. We'll talk after the call. Perfect. The call. Um, The call. Yeah, the call. call. Yeah. I think people should also be aware. BK is also looking around corners and seeing what's next. There's all these digital sort of online programming going on. So there's a series this week called uh, World Class Companies and really caring about the world that we live in. And certainly now more than ever, I think that we've got that need. For sure. Well, what a fantastic conversation. Jennifer, how do people get connected and stay connected to more of your awesomeness. Where should we point people? Thank you, David. My website is probably the best way. People can go on and take a quiz. I put it in the show notes. As long as you can spell my name, you're good. (laughs) Jennifer Conweiler, K-A-H-N-W-E-I-L-E-R.com. You know, I'm on mostly LinkedIn now and Instagram. I'd love to correspond with people. I'm always learning from all of you out there. So happy to share best practices too from our various communities like NSA. Tremendous. And we will put all of that in the show notes under this episode when people go to thespeakingshow.com. We'll connect you with Jennifer's social media, website, new book, old books. Everything is going in there. Everything plus the kitchen sink. So So last question, if we were to tie a ribbon around Uh our fantastic conversation around all of this, what would you say is one key idea that you would love folks to walk away from this interview knowing about the power of introverts. Use your strengths. Introverts are leaders. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 